Do you want to become a merit printer? Do you want to watch mages cry and beg for mercy? Then worry no more, as we have the answer for you. Join the cult of the Archer Maids. It's free real estate. What is up guys, Meower here, and today I'm joined with a very special close friend of mine, Shadowblades, and we're here to turn you into a fully-fledged merit printer. So, before we get started, be sure to drop a like, don't forget to subscribe, join the Discord, we'll be posting the guides and everything we found in the dedicated channel after the video's been up for a while, so stay tuned for there, and you can always ask us multiple questions there if you'd like. But... Have you ever wondered how you can achieve reports such as these and how you can even become a merit printer yourself? Well, before you become a fully fledged merit printer, we need to first explain how all of this works. And to do that, we need to explain archers. Now, currently in the meta, there are three playstyle or use cases for archers. Being an archer main myself, I've fallen in love with playing with archers ever since I tried it and a friend of mine told me about it. There are three main playstyles for archers. There is the normal attack playstyle, there is the counterattack playstyle, and there is the utility playstyle. These playstyles correspond to different hero pairings, which either increase normal attack damage, increase counterattack damage, or provide utility to the team. Now briefly, let's talk about archer range compared to other troop types before we proceed to discuss the different playstyles. As you can see, different ranged units have varying ranges where ranged cavalry is the shortest, followed by archers, and then lastly, mages. With this idea, let us imagine a battlefield scenario where you are the archer and you're up against other archers and mages. As you approach closer to the enemy, we can see that we have to walk up a significant amount until we can start doing our normal attacks to both archers and mages. As a result, mages will start hitting you first before you can hit them. Following this principle, what if we're up against 5 mages? We can only hit one with our archer while we're getting blasted with AoE. Well, this is where the playstyle comes in. The normal attack playstyle aims to zero down on one target with high normal attack damage. These are usually done by heroes who provide additional attacks, allowing for normal attacks to critically hit, or just boost normal attack damage in general through debuffs or buffs. In this case, you would have to make sure you are not focused while bursting down enemies one at a time. On the other hand, we have the counter-attack playstyle, where the goal of the Archer March is to tank and reflect more damage to the enemies. As shown on screen, we only generally have the option to target two out of the three targets. This is where the counter-attack playstyle comes in handy, as we aren't driven into a corner only selecting one unit. This is because when we are targeted, we are essentially targeting all enemy marches targeting us as well. Lastly, the utility playstyle aims to buff other physical marches by providing debuffs or buffs to your legion. Quite self-explanatory, but essentially, it still acts as an archer, only boosting the team rather than focusing on damage. Now, I get that there are different playstyles, but how do you achieve the Merit Printer status? Well, it's the insane buffs and debuffs that truly shape the archer's arrow and make it land straight into your enemy's faces, making you become truly OP on the field and print all those juicy, juicy merits. You got access to buffs such as the normal attack damage buff onslaught. You have access to the counter attack damage repost, making you either dish out insane DPS or punish people for attacking you. Like what better way to punish people than they just attack you and they die in the process of doing so. You have access to a buff called defense penetration. You have access to to repost. You have access to Hosk, which is one of the best commanders in the game, especially when set up properly. You have access to crits. You have access to crit damage. Like you're just, you're just gonna see so many numbers on the screen, and you're gonna see the enemy's HP just melt out of nowhere. Plus. 
not even mentioning yet the insane debuffs that you get from playing archers. You have access to defense break, you have access to fragility, making the enemies take even more damage than you're already dishing, and you have access to one of the most insanely broken debuffs in the entire game, which is the rage accumulation debuffs. Imagine you just slow people from casting rage skills and almost disable them if you're cycling your stuff correctly. Like, I just don't know what else I'm, I'm gonna say to convince you to embrace the cult of the archers. So now we're gonna be showcasing the best pairings for the Archer playstyle and what other pairing to begin with than my personal favorite, Hosk Nara. Yes, you heard that right, Hosk Primary, Knara Deputy, but why Hosk Primary? Well, considering our visualization that you've seen earlier, where three mages are targeting your archers while you're ab only able to target one of the enemy, we benefit more from the overall 25% defense that Hosk provides from his third skill, rather than the 40% increase when he is Deputy in the normal attack damage. But what about the control tree? Well, the control tree, while it is good, the precision tree is just far more better and it allows archers to do a better job of doing all the other stuff archer does, as well as providing almost the same amount of counterattack that the control tree provides. It's just absolutely broken. So now we're gonna be discussing the skills of Husk Primary. So we'll be going into the usual. We'll take the attack, overall speed, overall health, and then arrow precision. And then we're gonna be focusing solely on the precision tree. And here's why. Precision tree is just too good and it complements everything that we wanna do. So we'll be taking the overall attack. We'll be starting with the overall speed, over uh, last word, which is for the counter attack. And then we're gonna be going for whirlwind. The reason for that is because we're already getting Onslaught from a different skill, so it will be a waste of having two sources of Onslaught. Next up, in the next row, we're going to be taking, first of all, Cool Under Pressure. We're going to be working our way towards Intrepid. We're going to max out Unstoppable next. And finally, we're going to be taking a Mark of War. And then after we're done and the Commander is level 43, we're going to start getting Leftover Points. Now, these points, we're going to be allocating them the, uh, as follow. We're going for Irrepressible, and then we're going to go for Head Held High, we're going to go for Force of Will, and finally, the final two points, we're going to be dumping them onto Egoism just to decrease the amount of skill damage taken, as there is no counterattack for skill damage. As you can see here on the remaining of the uh, infographic, the skill priority, well, it doesn't really matter that much because the whole point of the march is that you need everything awakened. And I'll go more on that in a bit. You can see on the right, there is the artifact rankings. The best artifact for this march by far is the Rattle Spear. And if you don't have Rattle Spear, feel free to take Shadow Blade. And if you don't have either of them, you can use Viola's Bow as a placeholder till then. Now, for the advantages, the advantages of this march that it's tanky, it doesn't need much micro, it has the best counter-attack options, it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with almost any march, and it only has almost a single counter, and it's guaranteed merits. The disadvantages of this march, though, is that it's extremely expensive in a way that you need every single commander awakened, and you need them six-starred as well, as well as needing the Wilderbrook faction, you need more troops in order to constantly spam it, and it just starts to shine later on in the game as you approach T5 or RT5. Pretty much if you are T4.5, all the way to T5 to T6, and so on and so forth. Um, as for the playstyle, now the playstyle is pretty simple. You want to start by charging up, you want to activate the host skill, and then start to walk up a little bit, have multiple mage marshes targeting you. The counter attack will shred people, though. Make sure that you don't get too close, you don't want to get bombarded by artifact skills because there is no uh, counter to artifact skills either and you want to avoid taking too much AoE from being clustered up with your allies. You want to get the Rallo Spear defense penetration buff to activate when Kinara applies her awakened skill the, the, because this defense penetration does increase your counter attack 
you can also face tank, but don't go suicidal. There is no need for you to waste your troops for no reason. The effectiveness of this march tends to drop off at around 100k troops, so monitor yourself closely. And finally, just tank as many damage as possible from mages to draw them close and then retreat a little bit and just wiggle around till you feel like you're in a comfortable position to eat as much damage as possible. So the next march we have in our guide is everyone's favorite main DPS march, Sidrium Fragar. Now, Syndrome Fragar are a very special case because they need very specific conditions in order to truly shine, and we're going to be going over them in the following guide. We're going to be starting off to discussing their main talent tree, which focuses purely on the precision tree and nothing else. And the reason for that is because precision tree pretty much gives them everything they need. We're going to be going over the usual attack, march speed, HP, followed by air of precision, and then attack more march speed because we're going to be needing to position a lot with this march to get out of harm or just run up, hit people, run back. We're going to be grabbing strengthened weaponry because you gain an extra 2.5% attack versus losing only 1% hero skill damage, but that 2.5% attack is actually far more efficient on a march such as Syndrome Fragar because everything you do is related to attacking and critting. So it actually gives you far more value than losing a measly 8 damage from uh, from what's her face, from Fragar's uh, rage skill or an extra 4 damage from Syndrome's awakened skill. So in, re in reality, you're not really losing anything. But moving on, we're going to go, of course, for Whirlwind because Syndrome's the way Syndrome's uh, first skill works is that it does double normal attack and that double normal attack actually increases the chances of some of the stuff activating. It might not activate twice, but you have double the chance of anything activating per turn. Next up, we have Cool Under Pressure. And then we're going to go for Intrepid, we're going to go for Unstoppable, and then the usual Mark of War. And then we're going to run it back in the second column of the Precision Tree, where we go for Head Hell High. We're going to go for Force of Will. We're going to grab Suppression afterwards, and the final two points are going to go into Irrepressible. Next up, let's discuss their skills. So, Syndrome Fragar is one of those marchers that can actually function at 5-1-1-1 for both of them together as their main power budget comes from their main rage skill. However, of course, awakening them is always nice, though if you're gonna ask me which one you should awaken first, you should definitely work on Syndrome first, as they're both somewhat expensive, so if you have a limited budget, I would highly recommend you start working on Syndrome first, as his awakened skill gives far more value than Fragar's awakened skill, and his skills in general are just flat out better. Next up, we're going to be discussing the artifacts. The best artifact by far, which is Gold Crest for this march, is specifically tailored for Fragar and Syndrome in this march, and you're going to be seeing a whopping 100k plus on your screen. Whenever you hit that nuke, it's going to nuke every single person. It doesn't matter T4, T5. When I personally use it against T5s, I average 70k hits which is just insane. It's like a hack to delete people. But if you don't have it and you have other and you need other alternatives still you do, you always have Rattle Spear, which is always reliable and has an insane damage factor, and you have the good old Shadow Blades that just works for everyone. Next up, the advantages of this march is that it has one of the highest, if not the highest single target damage, rivaling even the biggest rage skill build for cavalry and the highest normal attack rates, as well as crit, and it's probably the best PvE Behemoth Hunting March as well, because whenever you're going to see people running Syndrome Fragar, just know that those people, if they're positioning correctly, they're always going to be topping the charts of the top 3 DPS, as well as they have the highest DM damage ceiling in the game if built correctly, which is why this build is, he this build is here, which we're going to be reaching that damage ceiling together. The disadvantages of this March, though, is that both commanders are kind of paid, so they're a bit expensive as well, though, like I said earlier, they can work at 5-1-1-1. They also need to be awakened in order to maximize their damage. They're very squishy, they need extremely good micro because the moment you're caught out of position, you're going to get absolutely deleted and you're not going to be seeing those glorious merits on your screen because you're going to be merit for your enemy, as well as Ferondel exists in the game pretty much. Ferondel just shuts down this march to the maximum, so you need to be extra careful with how you position and AoE will shred you as well because this march is just a pure glass cannon. If left unchecked, it will melt everything and everyone. Which brings us to the playstyle explanation and how you can maximize this 
March. This March is mainly reliant on normal attack as well as a hint of rage skill. The rage skill enables the normal attack, though it is not core for you to be in combat the moment it's active. Rather, you should just try to wiggle in and out, cycle your rage skills properly so you can maximize your, your DPS and your efficiency on the field. You also need to position yourself not to get targeted at all, which is easier said than done, of course, but rather try to hide in the middle of people. You know, if you're a higher tier player, sacrifice those T4s in order to face tank for you. There's no shame about it. I do it myself. You should as well. A bit shameless, I know. And you can, you always do need to reposition yourself on the elf angle so that you're far away from any deep, any AOE being thrown around, as well as try to be mindful of your flanks so that cavalry don't come around and just delete you. Another thing to keep in mind is that you should play around the artifact, especially if you have Gold Crest, as it gives you an extra burst of moment speed that you can use in order to reposition. Though I do need to warn you that Gold Crest is somewhat of a bug artifact, so do be careful when you're using it. I, I will go in depth on why it's bugged in a different video, but for now, let's just keep it in mind. So if you are using it, don't enter a building at the same time as it will bug out. As well, you should... Avoid all cavalry marches, which is a rule of thumb pretty much for any ranged march user, but for this march especially because you're so squishy and if Ferondel touches you, you are automatically useless. You should play selfishly with this march. You are extremely selfish on this march. You don't play for your team, you play for yourself, and you even win trades against Hoss Kinara if it is a 1v1. And finally, we have ourselves a utility archer march. That sounds a bit troll, but in reality, it works and it enables, it enables marches further. For, when I first heard of this march, personally, I, I just laughed at it. Because in on paper, you laugh, like, Nico Thea, what's that supposed to do? Well, we're here to clear it up for you. The Miss March is purely a PvP march that is focused on utility. As we can see from the talent tree, the talent tree is a bit wonky. Well, just hear me out on this, and you, you'll... You'll believe me more when you try it out for yourself. So we got the foundation talents of usual, attack, march speed, HP, followed by arrow of precision. And then we're going to go strictly into the precision tree first. And then we're going to be picking up the last part of the marksman tree with our final 12 points. So we're going to be going into attack. We're going to be going for march speed because march speed at later, uh, later parts of the game is one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable stat in the game because positioning is everything in Call of Dragons in the open field fighting. And then we're going to be picking up last word just to improve Nico's third skill, or rather for his fourth skill, making you deal an extra 24% counterattack versus just rather 20%. Next up, we're going to go for Whirlwind, of course, because we have other sources of Onslaught, so we don't want to overstack anything because the way um, buffs and debuffs work is that the highest percentage is always prioritized. And I discussed this in the previous video, so you can check it out. I'll leave the card up on the right or whatever, if I even remember. But yeah, uh, next up, we got Cool Under Pressure. We got Head Hell High, and then we're going to skip suppression for now we're gonna go for dedication because that we want that extra healing and again we don't want to overcap on onslaught because we can already get it from nico's third skill for 20 percent so it's just gonna be a waste if we get it for, for from force of will so we're better off just getting that extra bit of healing and finally of course we're gonna go for mark of war and then after that the next five points will be going into suppression and then we're gonna be going for marksman attack and we're gonna go for head hell high again so we can cycle rage further because the whole point of this march is just cycling as much rage as possible which we'll be mentioning later on on this guide and then we're finally gonna be picking up the last two points into more legion marksman speed like I said before, unit speed is one of the highest. Now, let's talk about the skills. So, this march, in order to be truly useful, you need Thea Awakened. Okay, you don't, it doesn't matter if Nico's Awakened or not, but it matters much more that Thea is Awakened, so you can apply her shield as an AoE and help other marches be enabled. If you don't have Thea Awakened, then I don't really recommend this march from now, for now, as it is a third utility march and underlined utility it's not meant to deal a lot of damage next up we for our artifacts we got heart of kamisai as my opinion the core of this march but if you don't have any other options we got rattle spear and of course we got the good old useful 
and reliable shadow blades, though I highly recommend Heart of Kamasai because its active provides keen and it provides onslaught for all your marches in an AoE cycle when you're running three archer marches, making your other two marches just run on steroids just makes them hit that much harder and you're gonna be printing much more merits from those two marches. Next up, we got the advantages. The advantages of this march is that it stacks a lot of attacks, so it still hurts to be hit by it, though it's not going to be as painful as other marches in our guide. The AoE shield works once the is awakened, so you can uh, shield your other marches, make them that bit of extra tankiness, can go a long way because archers, as a troop type, is usually very squishy which brings us to the next point is that it is a bit tankier uh, than usual because you have the defense source from head of Kamasai if you're running it or the shield from tia in general it can be flexed with any artifacts it decreases hero skill damage taken and supports other archer marches enabling them to deal that much damage and enable them to be a bit more ballsy on the field rather and be a bit more aggressive than they usually should though remember play smart and don't go crazy or too crazy rather and one of the main disadvantages of this march is that it needs Thea awakened. If Thea is not awakened, this march does not function pretty much, and it doesn't deal that much damage. And finally, it's only usable as a support march. Next up, we got our playstyle. So this playstyle of this march is rather different than the other two. One of them needs heavy microing, and the other can just be left. But this one, you need to kind of walk with the others, like depending on which one you want to buff. Do you want to buff your Kanara Ho House Kanara, or do you want to buff your Center of Fragar? That will depend on you. There is no right answer here, but just remember to target the same person from both marches at least, or all three marches, in order to maximize the value you're getting from your builds. It applies debuffs on the enemy, it applies fragility, and it applies defense break, and it can apply shields for your marches. Again, the Heart of Kamasai buffs will surround your surrounding archer marches, or rather all types of marches around you, so be sure to be the closest one to it in order to get the most value. And you should aim for a very nice rage cycling build that you can go in once your rage is ready to go and then go back out, go in, back out, you know, it will depend on you, star step and all that good stuff. And Thea's awakening affects everything Miku does, whether if it's from uh, his main skill or his final skill, both of them are impacted by the extra skill damage. Moving on now to our lower investment tiers of builds, which is the good old faithful Nico Kanara build. Now, this is the, one of the more popular builds, but we're here to revolutionize it. The first build we're going to be discussing is the main PvE aspect of Nico Kanara or Kanara Nico. So we're going to be splitting this in both. Kanara Nico will be the go-to for PvP, and Nico Kanara will be the go-to for PvE. We're going to be starting off with Nico Kanara along with the with the talent it has, which is more focused on uh, PvE Behemoth Hunting. We're gonna go for the standard attack, March Speed HP, Arrow Precision, we're gonna go for attack, even more March Speed so you can dodge every single Behemoth attack that's in front of you. We're gonna go for Strength and Weaponry, the usual Whirlwind, we're gonna go for Cool Under Pressure, and now you have two main options for this. You can either go for the Intrepid build, or you can go for my current setup, which is Head Hell High, followed by dedication for the extra healing, because you never know that little healing can help you in a behemoth raid. And finally, Mark of War. And now moving on to the Marksman tree, we're going to be going over the regular attack. We're going to be maximizing our March speed first, and then, and then the Intimidation. And then finally, we're going to go for this skill that I completely forgot its name. And then we're finally going to grab our final, put our final point into an extra head to come high. And you can just take a screenshot for the remainder of the thing, because I feel like there's really not much to discuss about this. But the main thing to keep in mind is that both commander skills need to be at least 5-1-1-1 to be more effective. But if, you ch if you're going to choose which one you're going to awaken first, you should definitely awaken Kanara first. One of the best low investment PvP marchers is going to be Kanara Nico. And the reason for that is because Kanara has access to the control tree, which enables her to deal what she does best, as well as enables Nico as well to truly shine. And the reason for that was gonna we're gonna go over this in the talent tree where we go the usual. We're gonna go for attack, march speed, 
HP, then Backstabber, and then we're gonna go for the Control Tree first. We're gonna go for the extra March speed. We're gonna go for Last Word, because you're gonna have a net total of 54% counterattack from this setup. You're gonna have Head Hell High, and then we're finally gonna go for Soul Siphon. Next up, we're gonna go for Blind Snare, just to slow people whenever they start to hit you. Uh, we're gonna go for Ambush, we're gonna go for Sage, and finally, we're gonna go for Red Reticent, 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 oh, who cares, you know what I mean. And then we're gonna go for the PvP tree, we're gonna go 5 points into Rivalry, we're gonna go for Fury Flame, and finally we're gonna pick up Army of Valor, and the final point we're gonna be putting for that extra March Speed. That is it for the talents. Now the skill priority is the same concept as Nico Kanara. Still, it still functions perfectly at 5111. It is a very low investment march that just truly shines as you level it up and as you awaken both commanders. It's gonna pack quite a punch till you have access to better commanders as you progress through the seasons. Because this is mostly a season one, season one plus, season two march, but it will fall off as time goes by and people get access to better commanders and upgrade their stuff further. Uh, it has the same artifact principle. Our Rattle Spear is the best on it, followed by Goldcrest and the good old reliable Shadow Blades. Some of its advantages is it has insanely high skill damage. It is a really low spender march that works perfectly fine for both of them, 5111. But of course, the best sooner you awaken. And if you're gonna awaken one of them first, I would highly recommend you awaken Kanara, as she's just that far more valuable than Nico. One of the disadvantages, though, is that it doesn't really compare much to Season 2 Commanders, and it's weaker than Sidrim Fregar 5111. It is squishy, and... Well, it's just a pretty much like a little low investment march. But as for its playstyle, it is a very versatile playstyle where it where it functions perfectly. Whether if you want to focus on skill damage, you want to focus on normal attack or counter attack, you can maybe run it as a little hybrid Hoss Kanara where you have multiple people targeting you. But, but try not to take too much aggro as you're much squishier than Hoss Kanara. You can you should always work around your rage skills, find angles to attack people so you don't get focused. And overall, it's just a very solid march that has rage steal, it has defense break, it has more skill damage, and it has extra march speed in order to reposition. So we're finally gonna be going over one of the most important parts of this guide, which is probably gonna be the Warpets. So for our Warpets, we're gonna be following a certain guidelines that we're gonna be utilizing to build every single Warpet for all three of our main Archer Marches. But of course, some of these builds can function for other types of Marches as well. But we're just gonna be discussing those three. We're gonna, we're gonna be setting our build around three key attributes from the Snow Peak Rock, which is gonna be Agility, Luck, and strength. We're gonna be focusing on augmenting our skill troops rather than ha using the warpet skills in general. And the reason for that is because the warpet skills in general do very small amounts of damage, and there is not really any that synergize that well with archers. However, there is an exception to this rule, which is going to be the pet for Syndrome Fragar, as Sy Chain Strike skill has a lot of synergy with the way Syndrome functions, especially his Awakened skill, but more on that when we target the specific pet to them. And that being said, let's get started on the skills for the pets. So starting off, we're going to be discussing Syndrome's pets. Syndrome Fragrant Pets, we're going to be using the Snow Peak Rock. We want the rock that we want to find the rock that has a talent concentration. And the reason for that concentration provides attack, which is going to benefit us even further. And it's going to follow the principle where we want to augment the damage we do. We're going to be looking to pick up Maniac Might, which increases our attack even more. We're going to be looking up to pick up Strain Strike. Now, Chain Strike is the only exception to the rule is because it acts as a normal attack, and you have a percentage chance to deal an extra normal attack per turn. So if you have a Syndrome Awakened, it says in his Awakened skill that you can deal an extra 400 damage factor every time you can land a crit five times. So the way Chain Strike works is that it can work as an extra normal attack. So theoretically, you can normal attack three times per turn, decreasing the amount of turns needed in order to activate Syndrome's uh, awaken skill and making your march deal insane amount of damage and increasing the raw DPS you have in general. But, well, 
you're gonna have to test it to really see how it truly feels, but in my opinion, it's probably one of the most busted interactions between commanders and warpeds in the game. Next up, we have Eviscerate, which is just raw crit rate. We have Timely Strike, which is also an extra amount of crit rate. And finally, we have Hit Weakness, which is going to augment our crit damage that much more. We're going to be focusing mainly on 2 Luck, 2 Agility, and 2 Strength skills per pet. And the last couple of pets are probably uh, going to be up to you to decide but we're gonna have those six core skills as they all focus on normal attack buffing. Next up, we have the Hoss Kinara pet. Again, same principle. We're gonna be focused more on the damage, uh, on augmenting our counterattacks because this is the whole point of Hoss Kinara, critting with counterattack. So we're gonna go for Concentration, Maniac Might, Blood for Blood, Hit Back, Shield Breaker and Swift Revenge. And the reason for that is because it all just synergizes that well with what you want to achieve for every single uh, situation. All these all these skills just augment that much more of what you want to do, whether if it's from crit rate to crit damage to regular attack and an extra crit damage as well, and Shield Breaker, which helps you mitigate that much more. Defense synergizing with stuff like Hosk six star uh, six stars, Kinara six stars, um so called Rattle Spear as well, defense break, and this extra defense break, you're looking at an average of maybe 35 to 35% plus uh, defense penetration as a buff for yourself, which can also help your counterattacks. So it just it all just adds up together that much well. And finally, we're gonna be looking at Nico Thea. So moving on to our Nico Thea Warpet, we'll be using a Snow Peak Rock with Concentration. We'll be having Maniac Might, which increases our attack percent, and we'll also be including Chain Strike. Now one thing to note about Chain Strike and Nico's Awakened, which is Nico gets an 80% has an 80% chance to proc 200 skill damage factor when he normal attacks, is that Chain Strike actually increases the odds of of Nico's awakened skill proccing. Now we also add this up with defense penetration, shield breaker, and for our fifth skill we'll be having track and hunt or pursuit predation. Now Nico's whole build revolves around high skill damage so we want to increase that skill damage by providing crit rate to it. And lastly as a luxury skill we'll have forceful concentration which increases the concentration damage. Do note that you can use this war pet interchangeably with Nico Thea or Nico Kinara as they both provide the same effect and both focus more on defense penetration and skill damage. Though do mind, some of these builds might change with updates in the future, but we'll be sure to keep it up to date as much as possible patch by patch should we find any need to do so. That is it for our extremely big archer guide. Of course, if you like content like this, please be sure to drop a like. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know what you think, in the, whether if it's in the comments down below or in the Discord. The link will be in the description and, and we will see you in the next video. Meow meow.